are you? I am really glad to be here today, and I'd like to begin by uh, thanking you for your time. Um, we only have so much of it in this world, and for, to have so many people spend 10 minutes focused on what I have to say is really special. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about um, my journey in healthcare, um, how I started, what I've seen, and what I think is going to be driving us to a revolution in healthcare in, in our lifetimes. So let me begin by saying that um, when I come out and I look at so many young faces, believe it or not, um, I didn't always used to be old. <laughs> this is a picture of me, zits and all, okay? I'm sure you love the hair. In fact, my son loves this picture because every time I say, get your hair cut, he says, Dad, you know, what about this? Um, I could tell you that this was taken when I was around 15 years old. And it actually was the opportunity for me to have my first patient experience. In fact, um, it was a pretty tragic experience. I, um, it started with me trying to save someone's life, and I failed, um, and that life was that of my father. It, um, it was back in 1979, a time and date I'll never forget, 1979, July 1st, on a Sunday, around 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I was down at my cousin's house, goofing off, and my father called and said, listen, we're going to go out to dinner with your uncle. Um, why don't you come on home? That was kind of a big deal, so on the way home, I noticed something amiss up at the top of the street and in my front yard, and there was some commotion going on, and I could tell something was dreadfully wrong. I got rubbery in my knees, and I had butterflies in my stomach, and I, and I ran up as quickly as I could, and I saw him on the ground in my kitchen, um, my father on the floor. Telephone off the hook, and uh, I could tell you that um, my uncle popped in right behind me, and we began to do CPR. It seemed like time stood still. And I could tell you that um, it felt like an eternity um, before help came. Luckily, my, my sister-in-law was a nurse. She arrived, and she sent me outside to look for the ambulance. And there I waited. And it felt like eternity before the ambulance came. And we drove back to the hospital um, behind the ambulance. And uh, unfortunately, my father was a victim of a massive heart attack. He was uh, dead at 50 two years younger than I am right now. So as I began to reflect back on that, I said, geez, you know, could I have done something differently? Did I do CPR right? I had no clue as to what I was doing with CPR. Nor did my uncle with mouth to mouth. If there was some test or something, I, I thought that when we'd arrive at the hospital, they would just solve this, they would fix it. So you know what? I decided that that was where I wanted to spend my life, to move into healthcare. So that's exactly what I did. This is a picture of me, really a very nice haircut again, um, as an orthopedic technician. It's really an orderly in the emergency room, and that's where I started. I've been in healthcare for now 35 years, which is probably twice the amount of time that many of you kids in, in the room have been alive. And I could tell you that I've seen enormous progress. In fact, it has just been mind blowing. And what you're going to see in the next 10, 20 years will truly be spectacular. So let's get this party rolling. Let's talk about the first big change or theme. So it used to be that you had to be at the bedside um, with a patient and a physician or um, a direct contact between the two individuals to deliver healthcare. Well, not anymore. Here's a picture of iRobot. Now this is um, telemedicine uh, that has continued to be rolled out across the country. It's advanced in, in other parts of the world as well. And what it means is that it is bringing diagnostic capability um, remotely, so you can bring expertise. So for example, if a patient were to present to one of our emergency rooms today, and they were experiencing a symptom of a stroke, this robot would be wheeled in or rolled in with the remote control into the patient's bedside. The physician, the emergency room physician, and the um, neurologist that would pop up on that screen within minutes would be able to look at the patient with high resolution um, uh, cameras, be able to retrieve medical images and the, and the electronic record quickly and determine the most appropriate therapy. So you're bringing world-class expertise to the bedside when the two um, in the past would have never been possible. Now, right now, this doesn't have an arm that comes out and actually does surgery, suture, or anything like that. But you know what? There is something that does just that. This is a picture of the Da Vinci XI. This is the most advanced surgical platform in the world uh, to deliver minimally invasive surgery to patients. 
Now you can look to the left, and that's actually where the robot is, is assembled over the mannequin. This is a laboratory where they're testing the equipment. Um, there's a series of arms. There's four arms, all of them equipped with a device that moves into the abdomen, all of them the size of a pencil. And it is controlled by a surgeon that is seated to the right under a console. The surgeon's eyes are connected to some to um, high-resolution graphics. It's a 3D immersion experience. And at the end of each of those probes that goes into the abdomen or wherever the surgical site that's receiving the, the treatment is what's called an endo wrist. It exceeds the ability um, uh, quite significantly than that of a human being. And it allows the surgeon who is hooked up and each of his fingers is connected to these joysticks to actually um, vir be virtually inside your body manipulating those surgical tools. You could staple, you could excise, you could biopsy, um, you could remove um, anything as if you were going through an open procedure. Now compare that. Each of these four pencil holes, when removed, the amount of trauma to a patient is significantly less than the old days, whereas you'd have to actually open up the patient from from head to toe, depending upon the procedure. So the next time your parents are giving you a hard time about playing video games, just let them know that you're training for surgery. <laughs> okay, population to person, okay? Everyone has seen the genetic code out there. I'm sure it's a, a bad memory for the adults in this room, but deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA, all right? It's the, fa it's the basic building blocks of all life. Well, it wasn't that long ago that we actually found out uh, that we could decode it. And, and I think in 2003, we, advanced the most, uh, we completed the most advanced biological collaborative to, to do just that. And since then, our researchers in this country and throughout the world have continued to make wonderful um, advances in understanding um, the implications of our genetic makeup. You have to remember that 99% of all of us share an identical genetic makeup. For those that have parents and, and children, they share 99.5%. It's really interesting. But this doesn't just sit in the lab. It's actually being rolled out So uh, for clinical or, or commercial applications. About a year ago, my kids actually bought me a, a kit, okay? And I was able to submit my own DNA. You drool into a tube. <laughs> you, you drop it into a box. You put it in the mail. And about six weeks later, you get an email. And the email has a hyperlink and you actually can go in and start to mine some information. So let's talk about me a little bit, all right? Um, my, my mother and father always told me that I was Irish and a little bit of German and French, and it turns out they're actually right. So you're actually capable of telling where you, your, your genetic origin is coming from, uh, from a, a global standpoint. So I thought that was kind of interesting. But you know, if you look to the right, these categories, there's wellness traits and um, uh, ancestral traits, and there are some things that I, I found kind of interesting. For example, I can consume more caffeine, or more caffeine um, that I'm unlikely to, to blush if I drink alcohol, but I'm also less likely to be a deep sleep, sleeper, and I'm pretty tolerant of lactose. Kind of interesting stuff. But then I made the mistake of clicking on the ancestry traits, and that's when things got kind of weird. All right. So, <laughs> So when you look at the skull and then you look at the word you, um, I started to get a little uh, concerned. So what this is telling us is that I have 317 Neanderthal uh, variants. Now what's really concerning is look at the line that's two, two, or, or two lines below 317. I have more of those variants than 95% of their database population. Okay, so does anybody know what a Neanderthal looks like? All right, it's not the, the human skeleton. It's the guy to the right, okay? Um, this was the, actually the best picture I could find on the internet. <laughs> My wife says it explains a few things about me. So let's talk a little bit about some of the traits of a Neanderthal. Now this is really interesting. Look A through, A through D here, straight hair, but less likely to sneeze after eating dark chocolate. <laughs> now I don't have that variant, but here's the weird thing. One of my sons actually has been complaining about that, and I said, that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Well, it turns out there's actually a genetic link to that. Less back hair, I've got that going for me, okay? But here's the best of all. Look at the last line. My son actually has more Neanderthal than I do, so he doesn't even know that yet, I can't wait to tell him. So, but this is where it gets a little serious. Okay, it's fun to learn about unique things that really don't make a big difference in your life, but there's also a variety of variants that they can test for. Okay, sickle cell anemia, Tay-Sachs disease. 
These are significant genetic challenges that would uh, really be something that could be devastating once you learned about it. So there's an ethical element associated with advancing genetics, and it's something that we still haven't tackled uh, from a social standpoint. We'll continue to have to work through that. So let's move forward with the disease to prevention. Wellness. Now, I'm not going to talk to you and, and lecture you about healthy habits, um, but I... Uh, <laughs> I would like to t tell you a little bit about uh, the fact that we've got um, the known entity or the, the, the dependent variable maybe being your genetic information out there. And then you have these bands, right? We're all walking around with more information being transmitted about our lifestyle. We learn, we could tell where, how much exercise you have, what your blood pressure is, what your heart rate is. All of that information is being assembled and collected and is providing more information to our researchers on how to, re how to maintain healthy lifestyles. And we're gonna learn an enormous amount about how to optimize our health and prevent disease in the future with this information. And lastly, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about craft to precision. It used to be that you'd have a physician you know, that uh, would train for, what, 25 years, and all of the knowledge that they've amassed would be pretty much gone when they retired. Often the expertise was with one individual that was based off of their year's experience, but you know what? Um, a lot has changed in the last, uh, in the last 20 years, and in fact, um, this is a picture of IBM Watson, okay, Watson Health. Um, this is uh, about the size of 10 refrigerators, and you probably heard about this a few years ago when it was um, competing in Jeopardy and actually won. Now, the basic architecture for this is really what I think is the most significant development. It has machine learning or cognitive capabilities. For example, typical computer-based learning was that you'd put in a set of rules, you know, and uh, if-then-else statements, and you could navigate uh, decisions and, uh, and, um, and conclusions accordingly. What the IBM researchers did was turn this on its head. So, for example, machine learning tried to describe from a rule standpoint the letter A. Okay? There's countless variants of, of A's, and trying to um, write, it, write a series of rules that would conclude on what an A looks like to a computer would take, would take years. Um, so what they ended up doing was, you know what, let's turn this around, let's give it a zillion different in instances of the letter A, and ask the computer to find the pattern, which it did. So effectively, if you can, if you can find patterns associated with letters, you can actually find patterns in data that, um, that is truly revolutionary. So what do I mean by that? Um, think about the fact that all of the data that's being mined now uh, with all of the wearables. Think about all the electronic medical records. We're spending billions in this industry digitizing records. When you have a supercomputer that has the ability to dive in, analyze thousands of journals, thousands of records, come back with results like it did with Jeopardy, okay, and give diagnostic recommendations with a level of confidence and be able to reference specific references in a, in a given document, it's enormously powerful. It won't replace physicians, but it certainly will be able to provide unbelievable, accurate, quick diagnostic information that would have never been available. And guess what? Watson never forgets. Okay, so all of that talent, all of that, that wisdom is there for the next generation. But when you bring it all home, robots, um, uh, genetic uh, understanding, um, telemedicine, it all comes down to that unique interaction that exists between a patient and their care provider. What do you see when you see this picture? I see mother, sister, daughter. I see fear and despair. But I see confidence and competence and empathy. And I could tell you that my personal perspective is that healthcare is one of the most noble professions that you could ever pursue. To be at the side of somebody at a time of great pain and need is truly special. Thank you. <laughs>